Well, welcome to our Good Friday service, both to those of you who are here in the building and to anybody who may be uh, joining us elsewhere. If you are joining us from elsewhere, then you've zoomed into St. John's Church, Buckhurst Hill. Uh, my name is Ian Farley, I'm the rector of the church. I am just going to explain a couple of logistics uh, before we start. So over here, uh, there's a nice um, table just to help us reflect a bit on Jesus' death, if you like. There will be, after the talk, uh, about a five-minute uh, period of meditation. There'll be a, a picture on the screen and there'll be a quiet music playing in the background. During that time, or actually during any liturgical time in the service, in the prayers or whenever, um, perhaps not during the talk, but if you must during the talk, that's okay. Uh, over here, there's a basket of stones. Uh, and the idea is, and this will just remind you, if you come over here at any time in the service, to take a pebble from the basket, hold it in your hands for just a few moments. You may want to say a prayer for others or yourself, and then put your uh, pebble on the top around the cross, okay? It's just a little act to help us focus on something that's actually almost impossible to focus on. So you could do that either during the meditation or any liturgical part or songs during the service, or you could, if you wish, want to stay at the end of the service for a bit uh, to pray or be quiet, you're welcome to do that. So it, this isn't a service for uh, chatting, as it were. Uh, if you want to leave, leave. If you want to stay for a, a period of time, you're welcome to stay. Okay? So if you are joining us from elsewhere, there will be that period of time uh, after the talk when, in a sense, uh, nothing will be happening, as it were, in the front here, but we are still continuing to worship uh, together. So if you'd like to stand, we have some opening responses and then continue with our opening hymn. Who is it that you seek? We seek the Lord our God. Do you seek him with all your heart? Amen. Lord, Do you seek him with all your soul? Amen. Lord, Do you seek him with all your mind? Amen. Lord, Do you seek him with all your strength? Born, 
We continue with a time of prayer together. Eternal God in the cross of Jesus, we see the cost of our sin and the depth of your love. In humble hope and fear may we place at his feet all that we have and all that we are through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch out for the morning. Out of the depths I have cried to you. With my whole heart I want to praise you. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Lord, have mercy. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Christ, have mercy. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, have mercy. We join in saying, Father, hear our prayer and forgive us. Unstop our ears that we may receive the gospel of the cross. Lighten our eyes that we may see your glory in the face of your Son. Penetrate our minds that your truth may make us whole. Irradiate our hearts with your love that we may love one another for Christ's sake. Father, forgive us. Amen. Really, in the attitude of prayer, we continue in song together with uh, our next song. If you'd like to stand, we'll pray.
Please be seated. We're reading from the Gospel of John and the 19th chapter, and we're reading the whole day, Friday, if it was Friday. Uh, <coughs> which is contained from verses 13 to 42. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, that's about 6 a.m., and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he then handed him over to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him with two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote out an inscription and put it on the cross, and it was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. 
Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own household. After this, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then the Jews, because it was a day of preparation so that bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth, so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierce. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he may take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So I've 
chose that passage because it covers the whole of Good Friday, at least from six o'clock in the morning. Jesus, of course, has been arrested in the night, last night, if you like, uh, and a variety of things have happened that eventually bring him to Pilate. But John's Gospel starts with, uh, if you like, the end of the encounter with Pilate at six o'clock in the morning. And it takes us through the day to just before six o'clock in the evening. We know that because the bodies had to be buried before the Sabbath day started. And uh, in Israel, if some of you have had the opportunity to go, they don't have the extensive twilight kind of thing that you might have in more northern hemispheres. It's quite short and it soon falls to be night. So this is the whole day. The total description of Good Friday in John's Gospel. There is, however, one verse in the middle of that reading, <clears throat> which I believe is the hinge verse, if you like, that we ought to focus on. And here it is. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And I'd like to just suggest to you that there are three truths contained in this verse that we need to know and understand. Principal thing, of course, Jesus dies. That's the whole point of the rest, if you like, of the passage. The rest of the passage is to describe death by crucifixion and to describe the number of eyewitnesses who were there to verify that this person on this cross was dead. He gave up his spirit. That's the reality. Crucifixion, nailed to a cross. Soldiers around who know what they're doing so that when they break the legs of the other two men who are still alive, which is a way of speeding up the death by crucifixion because it causes your body to collapse and therefore you can't breathe. But they don't do that to Jesus because they can see that he is already dead. But just in case you might go away and think he isn't already dead, there is a spear put in his side. And just in case you don't think that he is actually dead, Pilate gives authority and in one of the other Gospels we're told that he inquires to make sure that the body is dead before he gives it to Joseph and Nicodemus. Joseph and Nicodemus, two people, probably with others with them because they are important people and they may have brought their own servants with them, take down the body. Not only are they witnesses to the fact that this man is really, truly, actually dead, but we are told that there are some women at the tomb, at the cross, and they are watching. And again, in another gospel, it tells us that they saw where the body was laid. John is near enough to hear words that Jesus says on the cross. He is unlikely to be shouting it out, and yet John is there to record some of the words that Jesus said. John is there to take his mother who is there and sees that her son is dead. Mary Magdalene and his aunt are also there to see that he is dead. And we are told elsewhere that they are just some of the many women who were standing around there watching. 
brothers and sisters and friends, the whole point of this whole passage is to say this person on this cross was totally, truly, absolutely, completely eyewitness dead. And his body is put in a tomb. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So yes, the whole point about today is that God dies. But that's not the only thing that this verse tells us. There are two other things in the verse which are crucially important to our understanding of Good Friday. Number one, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. John, of course, could have been watching and said, in throes of agony, his head slumped forward and he died. But he doesn't say that. What he says is that Jesus deliberately bowed his head. And Jesus voluntarily gave up his spirit. It is crucially important that we register that Jesus' life was not taken away from him. Jesus chooses of his own free will to lay his life down, to give up his spirit. And he does so in a position of reverent submission to the will of his Father. That's what the bowing of the head is communicating to us. That's what the whole point about the Garden of Gethsemane teaches us. Don't you know, he says to Peter, wielding his sword, I could pray and at once my father would send 144,000 angels to rescue me. I could. But that's not what he prays. What he prays is submission to the will of his father. Take this from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will be done. Earlier in the gospel, Jesus has categorically stated, I think it's in John 10, but we might have to check that afterwards. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. And that's what these few words in this verse confirm. Jesus' death was a voluntary act in obedience to his Father's will. He died. But it's also something else because the verse starts, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It seems almost ridiculous. I mean, what a detail. But it's a verse of scripture from Psalm 69. And in the verse just before this, we read in the reading that in order to fulfill the scriptures, Jesus calls for the wine. I'm thirsty. 
so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. And throughout this passage, there are a number of times where we read that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Why are these soldiers deciding, okay, let's not tear up this seamless robe, it's a nice thing, we'll throw dice for it. Why did they decide that? Because the scriptures said that's what they will do. Why did they not break Jesus' legs? Because the scripture says not a bone in his body will be broken. And so here, Jesus gives up his life in obedience to his Father because it was a plan. A plan described in Scripture from the beginning to the end. It isn't an incidental event that just happens to happen because the chief priests were better and bigger and more powerful and organized it. Pilate doesn't hand him over because Pilate is weak. This all happens because there's a plan from the beginning of time. This day was decided before Adam and Eve were created. And the whole of human history points to, leads to, and finds its fulfillment in the Easter story. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, which he's just asked for because Scripture tells him that that's what he should do, and he knows that and it's planned, therefore he is able to say, it is finished. Therefore, he bows his head. His head doesn't fall forward out of control because Jesus is just about to choose to end his life. Jesus was dead. He was dead because he freely chose to lay down his life. And he freely chose to lay down his life because that was the whole plan. That's why we remember this day. Thanks be to God for his word. Just before we uh, listen to uh, a quiet song in the background, we're just going to say some responses. <clears throat> we remain seated. If you want to use this uh, cross over here, please do. And then the music group at the end of that will uh, come to lead us in song. Please stand at that point. When the journey makes us weary, when we hunger for your presence, when the climb becomes too steep, when the walk leaves us empty, When we stumble in our weakness. When the path before us is uncertain.
Holy God, our lives are laid open before you. Rescue us from the chaos of sin and through the death of your Son, bring us healing and make us whole. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you'd like to stand, we're closing with, uh, if you like, a slightly more upbeat song that reminds us of the things that come to us through Jesus' sacrificial death. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no been one and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future
Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <laughs> 